All right. May the fourth be with you. Sorry. Just had to get it out there. You're welcome. I'm here all week. I'm sure you haven't heard that 5,000 times today. Yeah, May 4th as we broadcast this live and stream PT Pinecast on uh, on Twitter, on YouTube, on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm sure some other places. Our uh, website is ptpinecast.com. Uh, do you want to say thanks to a couple of people keeping the, uh, the pirate ship afloat, as they say? Uh, MW Therapy. You deserve to love using your, uh, your, your electronic medical record. So it's time for something better. If it's time for something customizable, that's where MW Therapy comes in. Take a demo of their amazing EMR now at mwtherapy.com. I also want to thank our friends at CBDRX4U. That is the uh, letter, uh, excuse me, the number four letter U. The, get the ABCs of CBD at CBDRX4U.com. As well as our friends from uh, Jackson Therapy. Yeah. Uh, if you'd like to uh, have an awesome adventure, that's what they can provide. Providing awesome adventures in patient care for physical therapists who care about where they're going in their career and quite literally travel physical therapy. Find them at jacksontherapy.com. Exciting show for you today. And I feel like we timed this episode. I love when we time the episode really, really well. So the, the, the ultimate takeaway is how do we keep youth athletes in baseball, softball? How do we keep youth athletes in general on the field and not needing physical therapies and re physical therapists and rehabilitation. Very meta, very circular. They actually need to listen to us before they need us. They need us before they need us. It's like a, it's like a pre-sale. We can sell you something before we sell you something. Uh, so got a great show lined up for that. So if you treat uh, youth athletes, we've got some great insight from our guests. So without further ado, let's kick this thing. All right, welcome to PT Pinecast. The best conversations happen at happy hour. Welcome to ours. Uh, we have great physical therapy conversations so busy PTs can feel connected to their profession. Find us online at ptpinecast.com. I was breaking one of these koozies out again. If you're watching a live stream, you can get something like this for yourself or a CI or a student or a friend or just for yourself. I mentioned that. Uh, that helps to uh, support the show. Uh, guest today, giving you some insight also, has a great background, uh, insight into keeping kids on the diamond, on the field, on the rink, in the pool, without needing physical therapy. How do you get physical therapy without needing physical therapy? It's very meta. Uh, our guest today, physical therapist, rehabilitating several professional football, hockey, soccer, and beach volleyball players. I want to get into which one. Maybe you've heard of this beach volleyball player. Her passion is high-level return to sport training, and her goal is to get all athletes back into the game. Let's get our guest on the show right now. Physical therapist, Trisha Tomes. Trisha, welcome to the show. Did Hi. You, did you expect such a robust introduction? I come in hot. No, that was awesome. All right. Well, you're still in clinic because I'm in New York and you're in California. So you're in clinic. So I'm not, I, I usually say the, the first question is the hardest. We get the hard questions out of the way. Uh, what are you drinking? You're not drinking anything because you're a responsible professional. But what would you be drinking if this was happy hour time for you? If it was happy hour time for me. I'd be having one of two things. I'm really into uh, some wild barrel uh, sours right now. Yeah. And um, the other thing I'm really into is Horace Stouts. And you were we were talking before we hit go. I have never heard of Horace. This is like some sort of like like bougie underground. You got to know someone to know someone get kind of beer. Yes. So you have to go into a lottery to become a member of what is called their convocation. And they only allow 400 convocation members a year. And the only way you can get in is by if somebody drops out of the convocation. So I think last year there were like eight slots or something for like 20,000 people that applied to get in. See, all right. So this is not the direction of the conversation I thought we were going to go <laughs> first. But as a communications marketing guy, I think that's brilliant because what you're doing is you're creating demand by reducing supply of your thing. Well, first of all, you got to have a great product, right? I mean, if they didn't right. have a good product, no one would want to get in the convocation. So wait, wait, 400 members a year or 400 members? 400 members. So the oh, okay, so you're saying eight people dropped out last year. So it's like, yes. okay, it's like a bougie club in, in downtown LA or Manhattan. It's like eight people in, eight people or eight people out, eight people in. That's how we do it. Exactly. So, I mean, his big thing is now too is 
uh, Kyle, who's the owner of Horse, he's doing a ton of collabs. So that's kind of his big thing now, too, is he travels all over the country and he goes to all the microbrews and they do like a Horace collab and, you know, it sells instantly. So what does it cost to be in the convocation? Which also, I just love the fact that it's like this cool, like, you know what I mean? Like he's running with the whole Horace theme. I like that. Right. right. So all of his labels are birds first of all, which is like super cool. And he has this awesome artist. So the labels are really pretty. I should have brought in a bottle in here. Um, but it's, so this year's the first year he's done two levels of the convocation. So there's like a higher tier and a lower teal, tier. And the higher tier I think is $500 and the lower tier is $400. And then with that, you get 10 beers and then you have access to everything. So you can only get his beers that come on sale if you're a member of the convocation. So it's just, I mean, it's smart, right? Cause like, there it is. There's the cool logo right there. Right. That way it's actually, uh, H O R U. Oh, I got the wrong one. H O R U S. Yep. Who we have. Cause I want to say, Oh yeah. So is it after the, Oh, I gotta do beer. Cause Horus is like a Greek or an Egyptian. Uh, there you go. That there Horus go. age. There you go. There it is. Oh there yeah. Is. That's, that is a really cool kind of art thing but it's just so smart it's like and i love to take these things and apply them elsewhere it's like wow could you apply this to physical therapy i don't know if you could but it's always good to say like okay i treat because i mean you treat in your intro we talked about now we'll get into like you um some pretty high level athletes right so you're you're working with i mentioned football hockey soccer beach volleyball who's the beach volleyball person i want to find out about this so um i worked with misty may trainer for a long time um and traveled with her when she was on the avp tour and um in my younger more exciting years of life that's pretty cool and she had a career i mean like i feel like you heard her every time the beach volleyball time would run around like her her and her her teammates name which just that was those were the names that was the pippin and jordan of of beach volleyball for like a decade plus yeah she dominated the sport for a very long time Wow. All right. So if you were drinking, you'd be drinking Horace. I'm doing uh, Juice Bomb IPA. That's from Fishkill, New York, right down the street Ooh. as I've got it in my uh, my koozie. Uh, so cheers to you. Have a beer. Have a Horace when you when you get off uh, uh, clinic. Uh, first round brought to you by our friends from Owens Recovery Science, a single source for PTs looking for certification in personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. Find them online at owensrecoveryscience.com. They also launched their own podcast because everybody and their grandmother has their own podcast now. It is conveniently titled the Owens Recovery Science Podcast. All right, so the toughest questions are out of the way first. Um, so with your background, a passion for keeping kids on the field, but also making sure they never really come off the field in the first place. And as we record, uh, I dropped the cheesy Star Wars joke at the beginning, maybe may the fourth be with you and also with you. Um, this is perfect time because I know all my friends, kids are now really starting the seasons in the first couple of weeks on the, on the East Coast anyway of little league softball really good and then up then i mean when i when i was a kid baseball ended like july and now it does i don't know like where you're in california does it end does it ever end for a lot of kids does not end which is the problem it does not end here the kids play all seasons and they play year round and they're not taking breaks and they're also not doing the things they should be doing off the field so so first let's identify the problem right so what are the problems with doing that? Like, I, I I feel like I'm asking such a simple question, especially with an audience of PTs, but I want to make sure we cover all the problems because you got to identify before you go and try to fix a problem or solve a problem. You got to understand it. So I'm going to guess at some and you tell me if I'm right. And I'm, like overuse, specialization, right? Because we say we, we love to throw uh, every year when the quarterbacks are drafted. Oh, all the of the 12 quarterbacks uh, drafted first. They played a combined 37 sports. And yet parents will still be like, my kids of this and only this. We got overuse, specialization. Um, what else am I missing? I mean, those are pretty much the two biggest thing is overuse. They're not taking, you know, for our throwing athletes, they need two months of designated rest. So that's just flat out not happening. But I would say the biggest thing is overuse and really um just lack of education amongst not only parents, but coaches, you know, a lot of coaches themselves aren't really educated and they're either doing this because their son or daughter's on the team, or maybe they played little league or, 
you know, there it's it's not because they've educated themselves on kind of, you know, what should be done. Now, I will say um, the Little League organization, you know, we we're going to talk a little bit about the Little League World Series coming up, but Little League has tried to be better about um, you know, looking at and controlling things like rest days and pitch counts that are super, 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 super important to these uh, young kids. So before we move on, you you have a background in sports. You have a background in, in, in softball. I'll talk about that just briefly because I want to talk about coaches. You're also an athletic trainer, coaches, trainers, physical therapists, this kind of spectrum. So what was your background? So um, I started playing softball when I was like five and I nice. played all the way through um, college and I was a catcher. And um, unfortunately I went through two shoulder surgeries myself uh, for multi-directional instability. And, you know, sadly, I think a lot of that could have been prevented because so much time and effort was spent on the field and not doing things like weight training in the weight room and, lifting any kind of weights and doing any kind of scapular stability or rotator cuff work. We just flat out never played. did that. You hit, we just you, played. Threw, you played, you played, you played, and you played some more. Seven days a week. Wow. You know? And um, the, the, the problem with that is you're just, you know, you're, you're only developing certain muscles, first of all. And as we know, that's, that's, not how it should go down. Well, as, as I was taught, cause I went into, um, PT school as a runner and a triathlete. And of course I'm looking at things through my lens. Cause that's how we look at the world. Right. And once I saw it, once my professor in orthopedics pointed it out, they're like, do you're a one plane athlete? Like, what do you mean? Like you swim forward, you bike forward, you run forward. I go, right. So I need to get strong forward. They go, what happens the minute you need to go sideways? I go, that's when you get hurt. I was like, Oh yeah. I don't want to get sideways as a, as a triathlete. But I didn't know that as a, as an athlete, because I just sort of showed up to a race one day and I just decided I was a triathlete. But so so where, in your opinion, where should this education fall? I'm going to guess it's going to be all over the place, not just one location. But like from that spectrum of parent, coach, athletic trainer, PT, MD or, or, or specialist, like where where should that be, if not all of them? I well, all of them is the answer, but it really has to start. You know, I think the league's. Oh, need to yeah, take the, a, the the leagues themselves need to to take a a better approach and you know you want to coach great but first you have to come in and do this seminar where we're going to educate you on uh how about some basic throwing mechanics because half the time that's the problem you know these kids aren't learning sound mechanics so they're doing something repetitively and then they're doing it wrong so, um, you know, that compounds things. So I think, you know, if, if it really starts, you're, you're throwing mechanics. If you're going to start playing a sport at five, you better learn how to throw correctly starting at five, not when you're 12. Um, so I think a lot of that education needs to come right, right from the start in the beginning. And, you know, I know in, in T-ball, you're just supposed to be out there having fun, but that doesn't mean that you can't start off on the right note and the kids be learning mechanics correctly from the start. Um, and I, so I feel like it's a big circle because I started with the parents and then you one upped me well done with the league. So, cause that's the touch point, right? So it's almost like full circle, right? It should be start where you suggested, which is the league to parents or the league to coaches to parents, one of those two. And then you have athletic trainers, then you have physical therapists, then you have sports medicine professionals, but who should be and but it's got to be a circle can't be a line who should be instructing the leagues it's the medical professionals working with right. so now you see a, a good circle is right. that happening some places should it be happening more or tell me i mean it it's not happening no. um i don't have kids myself but a lot of my friends do have kids and my cousin has kids and you know when we have these discussions like my cousin um i hope she doesn't listen to this but she has <laughs> a my mom listens don't worry about it. <laughs> a second grader and a fourth grader who her and i go round and round on this topic all the time because she already has her kids in club sports which for me is a big no-no at that age the kids should be playing everything. They should be cross training. They shouldn't be specializing in one sport at that age. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard because 
parents, for whatever reason, all think, you know, at the my age kid. of five, that this, this, my kid's going to be a D1 athlete. My kid is the best, right? And it's the mentality should really switch to more of how, how, that's great. My kid loves the sport. How am I going to keep them loving the sport? And how am I going to keep them healthy? Because that's the other big problem is, you know, like I was telling you before here in California, the kids are getting so burnt out. So they're falling out of love with these sports and things, which is a whole nother podcast on lifetime. And well, yeah. And just a lifetime of physical fitness and things, you know, they learn to hate their sport and then they're not active the rest of their life. So it's, it all kind of, it's all right there. So what do you think that is? Is that the parents living vicarious? I mean, this is all subjective, right? Because we're physical. Yeah, we're physical I mean, but what do you think it is? I think it's a little bit of the parents, you know, living through their kids. And um, I think a lot of people have on blinders, right? You think your kid's the best and it's hard to see that maybe your kid's not the best. I'm not really sure. But the, the pressures that parents put on their kids are, it, it's just it's enormous or it can be. Yes. I, I heard a great line. I'd love to give credit. I can't remember where it was, but it was like the goal of sports really isn't to turn out professional athletes it's just, and, and the goal of art and the goal of science, the, all those things, the goal isn't to cur- turn out professional anything is turn out, is to turn out good people. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? All right. So, so now that we we've identified the problems, right? So how do we solve these things? You mentioned one, which I think would be a great, um, initiative anyway which is hey these leagues should probably take ownership because their product is really built on the back of kids and sport so if they took a little ownership of that they might have some more people playing sport and being interested longer um what are some other solutions from a, from a pt scope since that's what our audience is what, what do you what do you tell people like your like your sister um besides some of those things that you just mentioned uh number one cross train so kids should be playing all sports. If they're playing baseball, then the next season they should be playing soccer. They should be using all of their muscles and developing all of their muscles at a young age. Number two, especially, you know, one of the big things in in this demographic, right, is the little league elbow and the little league shoulder, right? And so when looking at these athletes, the the thing is, is a lot of these kids grow rapidly, right? So their muscle mass isn't keeping up with how quickly their body's growing. So they have no control of their limbs. Gangly. And they're gangly. They're gangly. They have, and you talk, let's talk about just pitching alone. Pitching right. is legs and core. The shoulder, the elbow, those things are the delivery of the ball, but it's legs and core and to, to me, the big thing would be getting these kids, number one, cross train. So just play something else. Don't play baseball. Don't play softball. Play something else. Number two would be getting them, you know, on a good, solid, foundational leg, core, rotator cuff, scapular stability program. Learn okay? how to do it right. Learning how to do it right. Got it. I'm talking high reps, low weight endurance type stuff right this is like neuromuscular re-educate this is neuro stuff this is like i remember i was like 16 or 17 and by no means trisha was i uh the ace of the uh, little league staff or anything like that (laughs) but i remember the first time i was probably 15 or 16 and i've been pitching you know uh, you know on and off whenever there were no pitchers on the team and i I was like 15 before someone said how come you're not pushing off the rubber i'm like i what do you mean i just thought i stepped in through and they're like you don't push with your back foot i'm like no no one ever told me that no wonder why I threw 48 <laughs> miles an hour. I didn't push. Right. Well, that goes back to education and mechanics. Right. So if you're not, if you're not starting correct from the beginning, if your mechanics aren't good from Changing the beginning, start. and then you're having these kids throw the ball a hundred times incorrectly, there's gonna be breakdown recipe, and there's recipe a, for disaster. That's exactly and that's exactly so, what we see. Uh, an hour ago, I was cross-training and working out with my neighbor. 
And I was he just he's like, he's not a PT, but he was like, What are you talking about today? I'm like, I'm talking to Trish Tomes, talking about like Little League. And he has a, a son who plays youth baseball. And he was like, Hey, yeah, my kid uh broke his growth plate last summer throwing a wiffle ball. And I was like, and he's like, What why is that? And I was like, I'm gonna ask Trisha, I have some ideas, but I'm like, overuse to me, also the wiffle ball, there's no weight on that. So you're winging that thing around. And something else you just mentioned, his muscles might have been developed because he's thrown a lot. Maybe a skeleton. He wasn't doing any planks or any push-ups or nothing, long axial loading on that, on that, on that arm to strengthen that. So when do you, do you see I'm I'm sure you see things like that because you made a look when I said that, like, mm-hmm, I've seen that. <laughs> just this week. Ah, of course. At elbow growth plate. Uh in a baseball player. I think he's 12. Yeah, think um he's 12. yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, the, the, the cross training, the Idol. strength, it's so important. And the, and parents just don't want to understand that because I think the mentality is if my kid plays year round, he's going to be better. Be better. When that is in actuality, not the truth. Well, if some is good, Tricia, more must be better. So how we can sit here and go around and blame parents or leagues, but what is a good strategy? What have you seen? Some people are never going to hear this. They're just going to earmuff it and they're never right. going to hear it. What have you seen in terms of communication and patient education or that moment when you've educated patient uh, parents and the light bulb goes on? What are some things you can suggest? Because I'm sure PTs are out there nodding going, yeah, I've seen this, but what do I do about it? Yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think... The key is on the eval day, especially if I see one of these, if I identify it before they're actually in my office, I'll set aside extra time. And then on that first day, I might not even do a full evaluation. My huh. first day might be a ton, a ton, a ton of education. Um, so I really take the education approach and I kind of lay out. Um, I like to also pull up you know, the it's eye opening to a lot of parents when you pull up the little league website and you show them how many throws their kids should be doing and the rest breaks. And they're like, their eyes are like this because now we have like, this right now. Like, like, so, so the body doesn't know the difference between a throw in game or a throw in practice and coaches are trying to, and I get it. If I were a coach, your goal is to win the game but the arm and the elbow and the shoulder do not know the difference. Load is load is load. So you're that's a great strategy. So so what are the numbers like ballpark it for? How are the numbers given like per uh, week or per day? Yes. Yeah. So this is actually a great uh, resource for your listeners is if you go on the Little League website and you type in pitch count, it will bring up a whole um, it's broken down by age. Age, good algorithm, got it. How many pitches? Now you also have to take account: is is th this pitcher also a catcher? Because yes. the catcher throws count every time, right? Every time I was going to bring that up. Yep. Are they a shortstop? Are they a third baseman? Those throws count too. So you got to think about that. You know, your kid can't pitch half the game and then catch half the game. That's not how this it's works. Throwing the whole, it's throwing it's, the whole game. It's you got throwing. suckers like you got suckers like me over on first base. I just caught a lot and I threw a lot of grounders in between innings, but I just I just caught the ball a lot, so my shoulder was fine. But that's <laughs> a great point. And and so what are the, the ballpark like weekly recommendations? Because this is straight up throws. Yes, this is throws. I want to say, um, I was just glancing at it the other day. Let's see if it's still up on my desktop and I can give you so um this is for age 14 and under. They say 66 pitches on four days rest. Wow. So if you think about it, if you were to throw only strikes and strike out three batters an inning, that would be nine pitches. And that wow. just doesn't happen, right? So um, there you go. That's it. So so we re I mean, this really would drop jaws amongst parents of of kids who are playing competitively because there's no possible way because they're they their guess is probably in the hundreds and this is 14 and under what we're looking right now on the screen but even when you go to 15 16 it jumps up to the longest with the most rest being four days to 76 pitches which right. is not a lot it's not a lot and it's not a lot when this the other thing that this isn't just pitching on the mound. This is warm-up pitches. This is pre-game. 
It's everything. It's how many times the ball is released from their hand. Yeah, because what are kids doing in the backyard too? Because they love the sport. God bless them. But the, again, the body doesn't load as load as load and they don't know it. Um, and, and this goes back to, you know, a lot of the things, there are things that can be done too. You know, it's simple things like uh, you know, you're taking infield practice. Each kid has their own bucket. They don't have to throw the ball to first base wow. every time to still do fielding practice, right? It's like they, you can, you can, do things where the kids are still practicing, but they're not throwing the ball a thousand times. Cause, cause the problem is, is that somehow throwing is always a part of it, right? We're going to, we're going to do, we're going to do infield practice. We're going to throw the ball every time we're going to catch fly balls. We're going to throw the ball every time. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Yeah. Tony Maritato, who we have on the show often is literally at a fifth grade little league game <laughs> right now with the kids. So I think that's very meta for Tony. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening along. Um, in terms of now we've got, we, so education seems like just knowing and understanding this as it's, a PT, as an athletic trainer, as a medical professional, as a parent, as a league, knowing is, as they say in GI Joe, knowing is half the battle, right? Uh, but they come to Trisha, they come to PTs who are listening and we're past that point because now we've been injured. Now we're in PT. What are, what are some of the common injuries? Cause I have a burning question from when I was 12 years old, which was the law when I was 12. And then I've heard it actually isn't the law anymore, which is curveballs, no good or not even an issue. It's no, more no good. No good. No good. Cur okay. Yeah. Curveballs um, just put a lot of stress on the elbow and, and shoulder, but mostly on the elbow and it's really hard to throw it correctly. So they really recommend that you should be waiting till high school years to learn how to throw the curveball. And why is that just better? You're not as gangly. Now you have control over your body and you're probably a little stronger. You've got yeah, your bones it, and everything caught up or what? Exactly. It's a mixture of everything. You're, you're more developed muscularly, stronger. Uh, obviously, you know how to use your body better. I you have better. <laughs> Hopefully you have better control. <laughs> I had no control then, and I have very little control now, but I see what you mean. Yeah. I mean, and you I had, kids, uh, eight, you had the freak kids in your league who could do it at, at nine, 10, 11. And those kids were not, no, nobody was touching them. And then the rest of us were trying to catch up and that's just a recipe for disaster. I'm guessing. Right. And then those are the kids that needed Tommy Johns at 12. Right. What other injuries are, uh, are common? Those really, those are the two biggest one. It's little league elbow, little league shoulder. The other stuff is more. What's what's little league elbow? Is it overuse? In, yeah, so like both of them are technically, by technical standards, they're both growth plate injuries. Got it. Um. So, but with that being said, we'll also see things where obviously there hasn't been damage to the growth plate, but they'll have damage to the UCL. Uh, they'll have rota severe rotator cuff strains. Um, and majority of these kids come in and you, you know, set up and do your manual muscle testing on their scapular stabilizers and they can't even hold the position against gravity. But, but they, they're also throwing at the top of their, at the top of their league, right? Before right. that, but they, but so strong in one direction and weak in, in another. Correct. Um, I don't want to get into protocol. That's what someone else like protocols for rehab. That's what, that's what some other shows might do. How do you talk people through because you have ESPN and when people, when professional athletes get injured, um, the sports casters say, well, this injury is typically this timetable. So then everybody adds in their head. They, they take the normal timetable and they subtract one or two weeks. Cause I'm, I'm going to do it really hard. So I'm going to do it better and I'm going to get done faster. How do you approach timetables with youth athletes and their parents? Cause you're not treating just the kid. You're treating the parent too. Well, totally treating the parent. Um, Again, education, right? Um, a lot of times I'll set goals in place like, okay, until we can do all these things pain-free, we're not even going to talk about throwing. Um, so it's a lot of um, just more, more testing, uh, making sure obviously that they're pain-free and that they have the adequate power and strength and that the resistance to fatigue, right? So that they can do kind of low rate weight, high reps. They can hold things for a long amount of time because that's what baseball is. It's a endurance sport. Um, and, and then also kind of the, one of the big things is 
from day one, I also show them the return to throwing program and show them how long it takes because people think, oh, my rehab's done. I'm just going to go out there and start throwing again. I'm done. I'm cleared. I've been cleared. I can go back to it. Well, here's so, a great question from the audience right now, which is perfectly timed. Uh, how do you handle the child athlete who needs therapy but is overtrained and parents won't stop the select training to rehab? Does he mean overtrained, Tony? You mean over overtrained or overused? Is my guess. So overused. this is, but I'm gonna say he's. I'm guessing he's mean over overused. So overtrained, yeah, overused. So so kid comes in to see you. It's the kid we were just talking about who now needs physical therapy. The the, the parents are like, listen, uh, some is good, more is better. So yeah, too, too busy to rehab. So that's what he's saying. Yeah, I literally am in this problem right now. So I have a high school age. Uh, indoor volleyball player day one brought the dad in we did all the education I went through every the whole eval dad there educating the daughter um, and he his response is well I've already paid the a thousand dollars a month oh. for the for the rest of the year so she's not gonna stop playing oh that's not even cart before the horse that is like that's 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 money before uh wellness i mean yeah and, and it's i mean at the end of the day it's hard because you want the best for these kids and all you can do is educate at the end of the day the parent and the yeah. kid have to make the right decision for themselves one of my new favorite quotes is from dennis morton who's a peloton instructor and he says, it's, I love quotes that are just smart and to the points. I make suggestions, you make decisions. Because exactly. ultimately, you can't get emotionally tied to their decision, right? If they agree, you have to stop it. I, you, have, you have come here for my professional opinion. I have given it. Your view of that professional opinion does not change the value of my professional opinion. And what you do with it is your decision, and I will respect that. Um, gosh, it yeah, can't be easy, though. It's, it's not easy. And I will say it's taken, so I've been a PT for 15 years and it's taken me a long time to get to this point of healthy separation to yeah. where I can walk away knowing that I've done everything I possibly can. I pre I've presented the information in every way I've known how I've educated, but at the end of the day, um, can't you know, do it. You can't, you can, and the same, the same kid. So she was with me a couple months ago and she has returned because of course her problem didn't go away. They just stopped coming. And I asked her, okay, so did you do any of the home exercise program I gave you over the 45 days you were gone? And she looked at me, she's like, not one time. Not one time. Not one oh, time. That kind of hurts you right here. Yeah. It's, I mean, <sighs> So it's Adam, frustrating. have you ever heard of Adam Grant? He's like a social psychologist. He writes a bunch of books, like Malcolm Gladwell type books. And he breaks it down. And this mindset helps me in professional work and personal life. And he said, typically people, my, myself included, and he says his, himself included, try to do one of three things to get someone to do something. And they all start with P. So they're easy to remember. It's politic, preach, and prosecute politic preach and prosecute right and we'll use those tactics because i want trisha to do what i want her to do so i'm going to persuade you or i'm going to preach to you i'm going to do all those three things and we know from science psychology research those things actually make people double down and dig their heels in even stronger and they're like no i'm not going to do that so that's great that we know that what are we going to do about it he says the the fourth option is the one that that works the best which is we need to approach it like a scientist. And the best way I noticed how to say it was the quote I just gave, which is I make suggestions, you make decisions. I need this to be your idea because if it's your idea, you'll own it. You'll feel it. I, you're probably not going to go home and do it because Trisha wants me to. Right. You're gonna, but if it's your idea, it's like, yeah, that is a good idea that I came up with after listening to Trisha. It's a, it's it's a little bit of a spin, so it's I, I call it Inception. It's very much like the the, the Leonardo DiCaprio mo movie. I need to plant this idea in your head, or else it won't grow, and you're never going to take it. But gosh, right. it's hard when they don't do it. 
It's hard. Um, I would say too, the other thing that I've gotten better at in my career is I, I'm not fluffy anymore. You know? <laughs> but it's, I'm not wait, 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 fluffy. What does fluffy mean? What did, what was fluffy, fluffy means like, I don't know, being warm and fuzzy and trying to persuade being, and holding the hand yes. and putting your arm around them. Politicians. That's and politicians. now, and now I'm just a straight shooter. I give you the data. I, t I tell you how it's going to be, how I'm going to fix this. And you either buy into it or you don't. Um, so you, you, but, you've literally taken Adam Grant's. Yeah. Without idea. even knowing. You, you said you used to try to politician or, you know, or like the mean people would prosecute. Like if you do this, then you're going to get hurt. You're never going to play. It's like, people just don't want to hear that. It's that, it's that fourth option, which is you've come here. I am going to give you the answer. You know, uh, before we hit record, I think I said this um, a lot of times people want to hear their ideas coming out of your mouth. <laughs> I have come here to hear what I want to hear. And if I don't hear it, I'm going to go somewhere else. They're looking for their ideas out of your mouth. And you just said, I'm not going to be fluffy. You ain't getting that from me. Yeah, you're, how, you're not getting that how did you? Me. How did you, for the clinicians out there who haven't gotten to that stage yet, because they still want to change the world. And I'm not saying you can't change the world, but you can't preach politic or persuade the world to change. It really needs to be their idea. What caused you to do that? How did you like sort of like, how are you okay with that internally to help someone, help another PT get there? You know, I think it was a lot of sleepless nights. My bad. Um, you know, you're up, you're thinking about these kids because I see myself in them, right? Yeah, I've been yeah. through it. I went through the exact same thing. So it's sleepless nights. You're sitting there thinking about little Johnny or little Mary, and you're, you're thinking about your discussion with their parent and you, you want them to be on your side and you want them to listen and do what you do. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to be okay knowing you did your best. Hard stop. You have yeah, to be okay with that. You have I to make okay suggestions. You make decisions. All right. So let's talk off season then. Uh, okay. You mentioned a, a good off, off season should be what? You said two months? Two two months. Of no throwing. Throw, no throwing. So that also means, you know, you can't go play water polo. That means. Different sport though, Trisha. Different sport, right? Oh, yeah. Same, same, same part of the body, right? Yeah. But people will probably try to like justify it that way. He's not playing baseball. Exactly. Playing water polo. Exactly. No, no volleyball, you know, similar motion, not exactly the same, but similar motion. So they need two months of no overhead activity with a throwing type motion. Um, so that coupled with that's, that's number one, they, every kid, they need that two months off. It doesn't matter what their age is. They need that time off. Um, number two in the off season, they really should be hitting strength training hard. Um, so really incorporate, incorporating the, the legs, the core rotator cuffs, gap stability. I mean, this is all basics and these are things that, you know, we as physical therapists, we've gotten a lot better at not treating the, the, the body problem. part, right. Like treating right the whole person right it's so it's like an elbow issue i that's my favorite thing people come in they're like why are you making me do lunges that my, my shoulder hurts i'm like well i thought you were a baseball player well yeah but why i'm like i thought you were a pitcher and they're sitting there and you can see like their wheels turning i'm like right. you're supposed to be using your legs you know it's not. like oh ding 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 <laughs> you know <laughs> um all right so we've got really that rest, that load management, that two months, we've two got months. getting stronger in the legs, in the core, in the things around the scap, the scap stabilizers. And then towards the end of the two months, they should be doing an interval return to throwing program. What's you that look just, like? That is very graded. Again, um, my favorite one to use is the Ke Kevin Wilk. Um, it's, it's an oldie, but goodie, well-researched. Um, and it looks like you're literally going to go out. It tells you exactly how to do your warm up. So, uh, warm up is usually a jog, um, you know, until you're sweating and then doing stretching, making sure to also do your 
capsular stretching for your shoulder. And then it's very, very, very specific. So it's like five throws from 20 feet, five throws from 30 feet, five minute rest, warm up five minutes. It's it, so it's very integrated and it gets, and it's very calculated and it gets obviously bigger over time and, and rest days are built in, but it's, it's, it's very well laid out. It's very easy to follow, you, but nobody does it. You know, what's funny is that you're saying nobody does it. And I'm trying to think of like the people that I know who have youth athletes or my, you know, people that I played with, they'd look at that and be like, yeah, but five throws, come on. But nobody would question five reps of 50 pounds and then six reps of 80 pounds. You know what I mean? Like, right. But it's load is load is load. Right. But nobody would question the weight and the number of reps, but they, for some reason it's like, well, throwing is what I need to do. So I'm just going to throw a lot. Right. And then we get hurt and we wonder how the hell did that happen? Is it my shoes? Is it the grip on the ball? It's like, you're looking in the wrong spot. You were right. overlooking the obvious. It's Occam's razor. Right. So, you know, the, the, the interval throwing program, in my opinion, is super downplayed. I mean, I think that is like so, so, so important yeah. um, for, for coming off that, that two months rest before you actually step back on the field is reconditioning your arm to throw. And you that's all. It. If, if you've paid attention, you haven't done it for two months. And this is how would you describe the overhead throw motion for a human being? I was talking to my neighbor again just before we went live with this and he's not in not in PT. And I was like, it's I said the word unnatural and it's not an unnatural motion, but it's like but, the shoulder is 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 for mobility. But you're looking to get so much motion and so much force through it that I mean. How would you describe it to someone who said, like, what is the shoulder? Is it natural? Is it unnatural? Is it just super dangerous? Like, I don't know. Well, we were just talking here in the clinic, one of my colleagues and I, um, you know, about baseball versus softball and why there's not softball pitching injuries. And it's because the underhand throw is a much motion. more natural. Nat is it natural? Is that a right word I, that I'm using? I, mean, I that's that's what I say. Yeah. I think it's it's a much more natural motion for the we're shoulder. Super, we're super exposed up here, right? I mean, we're really exposed. Which over goes back to the strength portion. You know, right. it's you're very exposed, and it's a long lever arm. Very long. Very well, long lever me. arm. I'm five nine, so I didn't really bring. I didn't bring much heat. They brought me in when there was like nobody left. You were the bottom of the barrel of the bullpen, Jimmy. Get in there. You're lefty, but you got nothing going on. But yeah, that's that's what I was trying to explain to him. I was like, I was showing him the hip. I'm like, dude, the hip is built for stability. It is a deep ball and socket, and the shoulder's a ball and socket. But I'm like, it's not. And I was using the golf tee analogy. I'm like, it's a golf tee versus a ball and socket joint. And I'm like, and when you're up here. And he, he's a mechanic too. So he was starting, he was like, oh, he's like, so it's super like, there's not a whole lot holding it in there. I go, there is, it's muscle. And if the muscle ain't strong, there isn't a whole lot holding it in there. Which these kids, there's not a whole lot there. Yeah. And they recover so damn quick that we're like, he's fine. She's fine. Just do some more of that. She'll be, you know, rub some dirt in it, walk it off, run it off. So uh, Little League World Series is coming, is coming up. Well, I mean, end of the summer. I am a sucker for it. I mean, I don't watch a lot of Little League games, not a whole lot on ESPN, but when it's on TV, I am a sucker for that and the well, Olympics. I don't know why. Well, is it the kid intros? Because I am a they sucker are, for yeah. the, the kid intros. How about the are, dude who was like, I, just, I hit dingers? Like, that's going to yes. be forever. That kid's going to, he's going to make a million dollars on that. Yep. Yep. What was Big his Al. name? Big, Big Al. Al. Big Al. Al. I hit dingers. He's going to go to college, walk in the fraternity the first day and be like, I'd like to pledge. And he's going to be like, I'm Big Al. I hit dingers. Like <laughs> you're in the fraternity. No questions asked. Um. So do you, uh, have you done anything with Little League uh, World Series? You've done that before? No, I've never uh, been to Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania, but I mean, that would be cool. It's the Mecca. It'd be really cool. And you want to talk about a time to educate. That would right be a great. Here. Oh, It'd be a great time to educate parents and coaches, you know, have a little pre-tournament education well, I, session. I've said this, and if anybody from NBC is watching or ESPN or ABC, I am available. 
email me. But I've always said for like the Olympics and especially the Paralympics, I've said, God, wouldn't it be it's such an opportunity to say, um, to throw a little bit of, leg, you know, a little bit of great information. And PTs are, we like to pat ourselves in the back that we're super fun and personable and smart. We like to throw the smart in at the end for some reason. And I just see like, wouldn't it be great to do something in right field or left field, wherever the hill is when they're sliding down the cardboard and be like, okay, so like, hey, this is why we have pitch counts and let's talk about it. Let's throw up a quick graphic of the shoulder and why that's actually important. And what is a rotor cup or whatever, you know, like let's talk about that. Let's have some fun with it, but talk to people on their terms. And then with the, um, the Paralympic games, I was like, dude, this is such a cool opportunity to educate people on like, what's a prosthetic or like, why are there different classifications? It's like, Oh, well, this person has a limb that's like this. And it's like, let's, let's expose, let's make the invisible visible. It's not just covered up with a prosthetic. Let's show people. So I think little league world series would be a really cool, uh, opportunity. And it's, a, it's the biggest stage ever. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I last year didn't they have some kind of world record viewership on on Little League World Series? We weren't doing a whole lot, so yeah, we were we yeah. were sitting around at home watching Little League. All right, last question I want to ask specific about this, and this was yeah. I think a debate. Are you on Twitter, Trisha? I'm not. You're probably smarter for it. Don't worry about it. That's not. You still don't be on there. I'm on there, but it's you got to wade carefully. There was a big Twitter uh, rigmarole. I think that's what we call it these days about weighted ball throwing programs thoughts on that because some people were like no man they're great and some people were like don't go near it uh in my personal opinion i don't like weighted balls why and i'm not this is just i just i'm just interested i just it goes back to again um unless this kid has perfect strength in all areas and perfect mechanics but that's just not the case. So you throw a weighted ball on the kid, right? And they automatically drop their arm. And now, and now we're injuring the elbow, right? Yeah. So they're always going to compensate unless things are perfect. And when and, are they perfect? And so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like it. That's how it ended up. And and I, at first, I remember being in PT school. I was like, well, that makes sense. I want to get stronger doing a thing. I should do a thing with weight. And then people were like, well, but look at this. And I was like, ooh. And that's one of those cool moments where you go in with like an opinion and someone doesn't preach, prosecute, or politic. They just go, well, what about this? And then you go, ooh, hadn't thought about that. So I wanted to make sure I threw that out there. What else did we get to talk about that you wanted to bring up? Anything particular? Um, no, I mean, I think my keys are let your kids cross train and have fun. Please make sure you're giving them the two months of off season. Make sure that you're adhering to the guidelines of the little league pitch count. Remember, if they're a catcher, those throws count. If they're warming up, those throws count. Um, and then just, you know, making sure that they're doing those strength programs to and, come back and, on, and the interval training pro, the return to throw programs. I mean, those yeah. are really the keys. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, so so really, it's load management. Their two month off season when you before you come back on. There needs to be an onboarding. There's an on-ramp before you get on the highway. You don't just jump into 80. There's got to right. be an on-ramp, right? right? And then do other stuff, which is really just saying be a kid. I mean, yeah. we, well, yeah, I mean we, have to, we have to now remind parents to help kids or let people, let's just say let kids be kids because they're going to be a kid. Yeah. In, in, in my opinion, the having the kids play club anything before eighth grade to me is just let them play everything till eighth grade. I played everything until eighth grade. I played soccer. I played softball. I played golf. I played basketball. I played it all. Yeah. And then strengthening. If this is a and sport. Strengthening. This is a, these are sports overhead sports, particular that requires a certain um, type of strength in a certain area. And if it's not there, you're going to see it. You're not going to see a uh, weak scapular stabilizer issue. You're going to see an elbow issue, but now Wait, we know it's, it's up or down the chain. Yeah. And mechanics. Mechanics. Okay. Mechanics okay. are, are su super important. You know, if you're going to do something a hundred times, you better be doing it right. right. <laughs> I mean, there's the core of the episode, right? If you're going to do something a hundred times, you should probably be doing it right. All right. Uh, Trisha, uh, we do a thing on the show called uh, three questions. Are you ready for three questions? Sure.
All right. Three questions is brought to you by our friends from Physical Therapy and Balance Centers. Uh, created by PTs, especially for PTs in private practice. On average, a private practice that joins the physical network grows more than 40%. If you're ready to discover how the largest network of PT private practice owners are growing and adapting to industry changes, visit physicalfranchise.com. They spell it funny. That's F-Y-Z-I-C-A-L franchise.com. Uh, so three questions. Uh, who is someone the audience should follow to learn more about today's topic? I mean, you tipped off, you tipped your hand a little bit with Kevin Wilk, but who, who's someone, if, if not Kevin, who would you suggest? Uh, Kevin Wilk and Dr. Andrews, I would say, are pretty passionate about these things. Um, I got to be on a call with Dr. Andrews where he actually, he was coming in all fired up after seeing a kid that was 12 and had a completely torn UCL and wow. needed Tommy Johns. And he came in and, you know, he said, this is essentially child abuse, right? So wow. he's very, they're both very passionate about this. So, um, and both of them do excellent research in this area. So those are my two go-tos. Love that. Uh, what is something the audience should take a, a look at? Where would you send people if they want to take a deeper dive into some of the things we talked about today? What's a resource you would point them in? Um, I think for parents, the Little League website is actually, they've upped their game on Good. education. They're moving in the right direction. They're Good. trying to be better. I think that they know that they're injuries, the injury rate in shoulders and elbows in these kids has become a problem. So I think that is an excellent resource for parents. Um, I think for, for PTs and for us, really anything Wilk or Andrews writes is. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I think even just arming PTs with the little league information to show parents, cause you're like, listen, this isn't just what I feel or think or believe this is what the league is saying. This is what the this is what the it's, you know the governing body is saying, or the the large body is saying. The pitch count and the uh, return to throwing or interval throwing program are both printed out and in my desk. There you go. There you go. So I don't even have to look them out. I'm like, here you go. Okay. And now for the audience of 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 people listening, we're mainly physical therapy, uh, physical therapists, PTAs, or or students of both those disciplines. Why should they care about this topic that we talked about today? What's What's the big overall, it's just plain wrong that people don't pay more attention to this? Um, I mean, I think I think not only are we experts in rehabilitation, but we should we are also the experts in how to prevent these things. So why not use the tools we have to prevent them from even happening? You don't I want mean, Dr. Andrews getting on that call all fired up and yelling child no. abuse because he's right. So let's prevent the abuse of the children. We, we know what to do. We know what to do. All right, last thing we do on the show is called the parting shot. All right, parting shot is brought to you by the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Take a peek at their current concepts of orthopedic PT. They're in their fifth edition, a perfect roadmap. A lot of people thinking about committing to or maybe taking that OCS exam. No matter where you are in your career, they can get you prepared for that test or just leveling up your orthopedic game. Find them online at orthopt.org. All right, Trisha, last chance for a parting shot. This is your mic drop moment or your soapbox. You can reiterate something or just say something. Remember, the audience is PT. So what would your parting shot for today be? I mean, I think my parting shot is... Uh... Just remember all the things we can do off the field to make the kids better on the field, which is, you know, really honing in on on preventing these things from from even happening to begin with. Well said. Yeah. Uh, how do you prevent people from needing PT? Uh, see a PT before they need to see a PT. Right. They think of us as rehabilitation. But what if we could prevent that? And that is a great space to be in to prevent those things and prevent people from missing out on big parts of their life that they like to do. Uh, Trisha Thomas, appreciate your uh, your time. Thanks for having a drink with us. Thank you. All right. They said the best conversations happen at happy hour. Thanks for coming to ours. Thank you.